So, remember when pirate movies were popular? I'm a pirate, ah. Yeah, those were good times. It's too bad they got super old super fast. But back in 2003, we got Pirates of the Caribbean, a movie that inspired a whole host of other movies to try and replicate that success by doing the exact same thing even as recently as a few years ago. And it wasn't just pirate movies, it was a whole slew of adventure movies trying to replicate that Pirates vibe, with so many filmmakers pushing stuff out, even the guy who made Pirates tried to replicate it, with mixed results. Studios will keep churning them out until, I guess they make negative dollars? It wasn't just Pirates that was a success though, there were plenty of others that weren't as commercially successful as that was that managed to become timeless classics that play on that whimsical adventure spirit. Stuff like Castle in the Sky, Princess Bride, Hook, and Treasure Planet, while not being too financially successful, they still managed to stand out as some modern era classics. And that was even before Pirates of the Caribbean came out. But not everything has been remembered so fondly, and I'm here to talk about one that was pretty much forgotten the second it came out. Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, starring Brad Pitt, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Michelle Pfeiffer, that white gold. When I was a kid, this movie was my jam. I thought this movie was so fun, and it was one of my earliest exposures to Greek and Roman mythology. I loved this movie so much, I owned two copies of it on DVD. That's a real thing that I did. I did it for me. I liked it. And it didn't really light up the box office though, and never really clicked with general audiences. Probably because it came out a week after Pirates of the Caribbean did. Nice move, DreamWorks. Ah! But after rewatching it the other day, I think it's worth a second look. So let's dive into this overlooked, underrated movie that still makes me want to be a pirate all these years later. He is way more of a pirate than you will ever be. The movie starts out with Eris, the goddess of discord. Yeah, I hadn't heard of her either. And she wakes up to wreak some havoc on the world. Good God, look at this animation. Eris is still one of the best looking cartoon characters I think I've ever seen. She looks like smoke moving under water. I had never and still have never seen animation quite like this before. Michelle Pfeiffer is pitch perfect with the voice, giving her such a sneaky yet seductive accent. The way she moves and slithers like a snake, it's so cool and creepy. <laughs> And how she constantly changes sizes depending on what she's trying to get people to do is just so brilliant and inventive. I'm really glad that After Shrek DreamWorks didn't just stick with the 3D animation because it would not have worked nearly as well in this movie. Yeah, there's 3D animation, but I feel like it blends better with the 2D animation than almost anything I've ever seen. It takes full advantage of the 3D technology available, but it doesn't overuse it. And you know how in most cartoons they only bother to animate things that characters are going to interact with, which totally ruins the suspense of where they're going to go and what's going to happen? This movie does that so much better. Everything in the foreground is given the same level of realism as everything else. You gotta give the filmmakers respect for that. It, it really does help us get involved. <laughs> Anyway, she wakes up and sets one of her awesome looking constellation monsters, God, doesn't that just sound cool, onto a ship with a prince guarding a priceless treasure, the Book of Peace, which of course does something. It, it keeps the peace, I guess, or at least makes it not cloudy outside. Shouldn't you call it the Book of Weather then? Uh, whatever. And Sidbad, a pirate, is of course on the prince's tail trying to steal it. He and his crew jump aboard and start their sword fights, which look Super cool. The moves are almost tailor-made for this type of animation. So much of the action in this movie is done so creatively and with such an energy you can't help but enjoy yourself. I mean, in real life, you can't just bite a sword that's charging at you, but that doesn't mean I don't want to see it happen. You gotta admit, they're pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool, huh? But Sinbad sees the prince, and you know that they must have been best friends with secret handshakes, heart-shaped necklaces, the whole nine yards. The visual differentiation between Sinbad and Proteus, the prince, is awesome. From colors to presentation, first look, you really see how different their lives are, but then you start seeing their fighting styles and how well they seem to counter each other, it's a great visual representation of history between the two. It really helps to show who they were and who they are now 
now, and it becomes especially evident they have history when they start fighting the giant sea monster together. The whole sea monster fight is pretty cool. You see Sinbad's ingenuity, constantly thinking on his toes, and it makes you really see that cool genius badass that everybody wants to be when they see a movie like this. Plus, the... Yeah! Give that guy a raise. It was hilarious. This movie surprised me with how many honest laughs I had while watching it. <laughs> Once they take down the monster, there's a moment that's so small that can almost tell you everything about who Simbad really is just with his actions. As the monster falls back into the ocean, its tentacles come for him and Proteus, and instead of saving himself, he saves Proteus and gets himself dragged underwater, presumably to his death. That's some great visual storytelling and foreshadowing of the end of the movie. He truly isn't as black-hearted as everyone keeps telling him he is. There's a lot more under the surface, bubbling, just waiting to get out. That's some solid storytelling with just one simple visual cue. Well done. So, Eris convinces Simbad to steal the Book of Peace for her while they're hanging out in a bubble underwater. As one does. This scene gives us a ton of foreshadowing for various aspects of the movie, for how to get to Tartarus, to the word of a goddess being her bond. And we see Eris has a plan more than just to steal the book. What is it, however, we can't quite figure out yet, but it leaves us intrigued about where she's going. Hmm, I'm intrigued. The movie rewards us for paying attention, and because it's a kid's movie, there are plenty of visual cues to help them stick in our heads a little better. And so when Sinbad brings them up later, we feel like we're just as clever and smart as active audience members. I am too smart! I am too smart! SMRT! Eris almost reminded me of the Joker in this scene, too, where if what she's asking Sinbad to do happens, she's probably fine with it, but she has backup plans for her backup plans. She's just relishing the chaos that ensues from her actions, and how morally confused everyone is becoming because of her. I mean, she's literally the goddess of discord, and the Joker is an agent of chaos. This feels like a match made in heaven. Well, probably not heaven. So hail Satan. And have a lovely afternoon, madam. So Sinbad goes to Syracuse to steal the book for her, and he and his crew go to a big party for Proteus. Sinbad's crew is also so much fun to watch. They're not the deepest characters, but they all have little quirks and charms that make them a constant stream of entertainment. My favorite would probably be Rat. He's always swinging around and stuff. It's like he's allergic to the ground. But then Sinbad sees the girl he once loved, and his true personality comes out once again. He's a man confused and lost in love. Lost in so he insists they leave so he doesn't have to face his fears. Gee, I wonder if she's going to come back and join them in their adventures. Probably not. I mean, she's so obviously happy staying put and being an ambassador. Probably doesn't even like the ocean. I'm gonna agree. You fool! Okay, yeah, well, it's obvious she's going to come with them. She's still a cool character, fun to watch, and fun to see how similar she and Sinbad are. Then Eris, being all evil and stuff, goes to steal the book herself and blame Sinbad. Feels like with how much protection you had on the ship for the book, you'd have more than just one inept guard for it. But whatever, King, who we've been told has spent years preparing for the book's arrival, you do you. I love the way Eris steals it too. She's slithering around the room, only letting herself seen when she wants to be. Look at that blow-up doll of Sinbad she makes. I mean, who thinks of cool stuff like that? It's actually, I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> the animators could have just had her transform into Sinbad, but this is like way cooler. They clearly had fun with Eris every single frame she was on screen. Eris was the most challenging character in, in the movie. Just for the design of her, she appears and reappears, and so much of her was discovered in the animation. So she knocks out the guard, steals the book, and frames Sinbad, who was sentenced to death for stealing it. But Proteus, being the noble and trusting all-around best guy on the planet, decides to trade his place for Sinbad's. The judge gives Sinbad 14 days to go get the book back from Tartarus, or Proteus dies. So the movie sets up a time frame, stakes, and consequences. Pretty much all the elements needed for a solid, straightforward action adventure film like this. <laughs> At first, Sinbad is hesitant to get the book, with his right-hand man, Kale, who, much like Maui, never needs to wear a shirt in his damn life, telling Sinbad he's making the wrong move. It isn't until the woman, Marina, stows away on his ship and bribes him to get the book that he reconsiders his choices. So, then they're off. You want to see the wizard? Tartarus. As Eris looks upon them from her realm, with an awesome visual of the ocean being a martini glass. God damn, I can't... I can't I can't stress the creativeness of this animation enough. Can't stress that enough. Don't just 
throw it out the window. Then Eris decides time to send some sirens their way to stop them. Siren scene here is done better than I think anywhere I've seen them before, besides maybe Oh Brother Where Art Thou. The music is straight up hypnotic, not just for them, but for us. Their water elemental look is so cool, and their danger feels so extremely real. I mean, they're literally made of water. When they start kissing these guys, they're literally starting to drown. And I love the way the siren song is constantly ramping up with the danger. There's pressure, it's tense, and you get to see Marina's ingenuity and skill, rather than just a lot of movies that tell you, oh, this person? Yeah, they're the best and smartest at everything they do. Show, don't tell movies, it's really important. Though I do have to wonder, how does she know where everything is on the ship? I guess she's been there for all of one day, but she was locked in a storage closet till about 30 seconds ago. Yeah, whatever. She leads them out and then everyone snaps out of their trance. Snap back to reality, oh, there goes gravity. And I love this little thank you, you're welcome between Sinbad and Marina. A classic romance trope, but done with enough charm not to be mad at it. The ship is pretty banged up, so they go to an island to get some supplies, leaving Kale with the ship. Don't worry, Sinbad, I'm sure it's in good hands. Are you in good hands? Get it? Because he's the all-state guy. Till the island is shown to be a giant fish. Oh my god. Megalodon. As they make their escape, they see it's heading towards Tartarus, and both Marina and Sinbad have the same idea to hook onto it. They don't say it, but they give each other a look like they know what they're thinking. Again, doing a great job of showing their connection rather than just talking about it. Then we get a classic bonding moment between the two of them, talking about past adventures and dreams. I do love the pickles and egg joke here, by the way. A sword at my throat, at my chest, at my- PICKLES AND EGGS! I didn't really get it as a kid, but I definitely do now. Eris then freezes their boat in place and sets an iceberg on them, almost like she's the audience of the movie asking for an action scene. She literally says, Enough talking. Time for some screaming. And this scene? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah! It's not crazy or innovative or anything like that, but it's great to watch. You get to see Simbad's quick thinking when all he has is a knife and a shield. And the monster looks cool and the chase scene actually feels intense. This movie is great at making tension feel real with each scene. Good job, directors. High five, guys. Plus, I really do understand now that a good knife has a thousand and one uses. After this, they break free of the ice and finally make it to Tartarus, which is awesomely portrayed as the edge of the world. I love the joke between the twin crew members. Pay up, it's flat. It's just little quirks like this that keep things lighthearted and fun the whole time. So they make their ship fly like they're Captain Hook going to Neverland. You can fly, you can fly, you can fly, you can fly, you can fly. And Sinbad and Marina swing into Tartarus. I like that his hat flies off. And I noticed throughout the movie that his hat is a nice little way of him keeping his guard up. Like he puts it over his face when he's first talking to Marina. And now that he's finally opened himself up to her, he doesn't really need it anymore. But guys... That's not how rope works, or gravity, for that matter. You probably wouldn't make it in the gates that way, but still a dope entrance. That is the dopest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I hate to bring up the animation design again, but the way Tartarus looks is so cool. Oh my god, it's just too dope, the pipes. <laughs> Feels like a land outside of time almost, with sand flowing through, revealing various parts of human history. I just got so curious during this scene as to what happens and has happened in this realm. You tell the world what happened here. What happened here? I don't know. You need to tell them. He meets Eris, she gets all flirty with him, and she gives him a simple question for the book. Would he go back even without the book? Optimistic, Simbad says, Hell yeah! But she claims he's lying, and they leave empty-handed. Nothing! Marinating on this, Sinbad truly feels bad about losing the book. Not like he was at the beginning of the movie, hiding his emotions, but just letting it all out. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it. The movie often feels mature in what it's saying and how the characters act. Clearly, Sinbad feels that this persona he puts on wouldn't go back. And you see Eris is playing on those insecurities in hopes of reverting him back to his amoral attitude. Your heart is as black as mine. You're wrong! But once he sees what he needs to do to earn the love of the woman that he loves, he chooses to go back. He's not thinking of tricking Eris or anything, he's just genuinely trying to do something good for his friend and his love, and the world even, realizing that Proteus's death would plunge the world into more chaos. He's proving Eris wrong not by shady tactics like she would, but with honest-to-goodness honor, even from the world's best pirate. Are you a pirate? 
pirates are in this year? He goes back to sacrifice himself, and Eris, being bound by her word, saves him and gives him back the book, restoring balance to the world and defeating the Fire Lord. Or that, or, sorry, different cartoon. Love that at the end, he still can't stay at the party where he knows the woman he loves won't be with him. So he leaves, still hiding his true feelings, because you can face down a giant monster or two, but you can't deal with your emotions. That's the real thing. Deep levels here, guys. Hashtag deep. But Proteus, being kind of the nicest guy on the planet, realizes Marina loves both Sinbad and the sea, and he tells her to go with her heart. So she hides on the ship and surprises Sinbad, and they kiss in front of the sunset on their way to their next adventure. It's a real sweet ending. Makes me wish we got a sequel with these characters, which I guess we probably still could, but given that pirate movies are not exactly a cash cow at the box office, I'd say it's pretty unlikely. But then again, these days, what even is a box office? We're all going to die! DreamWorks nestled this movie between Shreks 1 and 2, and it's easy to see why. It somewhat lampoons the adventure drama just like Shrek did with fairy tales by incorporating all these elements of mythical creatures from past historical contexts and throwing our reluctant hero right in the middle. The only difference was kids are much more familiar with fairy tales, not so much with Greek gods, so it was probably a little less appealing to them at the time, especially with Pirates of the Caribbean already in theaters. That doesn't make it any less fun and entertaining though. I think checking it out now as an adult, there's still a lot to appreciate about its cleverness and storytelling. Overall, it's just under an hour and a half with credits, not wasting any time on dull moments and using every moment to keep the characters and story going or make jokes that genuinely still made me laugh. At least he's not out robbing someone. That's because everyone worth robbing is here. Yeah, it's not Finding Nemo or anything, and I wish in the middle, Eris had more to do than just watch. But it's still an exciting adventure film with a decent amount of character depth, and it plays with the lore of different adventure movies, much like Pirates did without the limitations of live action, though. Similar to Road to El Dorado, it relies on wit and charm of the main characters, only I think with better results because of the natural charisma of Brad Pitt, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Michelle Pfeiffer. Character-wise, the whole film can be summed up with the question asked early on by Proteus. Who are you now? Every character has to question the decisions they've made in their lives and whether those are things they actually really want to do. You see, Eris is never going to change and she never wants to change, but Simbad and Melina have real choices and real decisions to make regarding their happiness. But how they felt and how they deal with those feelings was so relatable that you can't help but admire the movie for making us feel invested when a lot of other animations just do the bare minimum because it's a film made for kids. <coughs> So I'd recommend checking this one out. It's not that long, it's not that bad. So you won't find yourself saying, there's 85 minutes of my life I won't get back. Yeah, you won't be getting the back or any other minutes back. That's how time works. So just sit back and enjoy the movie. I'd be happy to lend you one of my DVDs, presuming I can find them. And it's gonna be up to you to find them before they are murdered. I'm like, baby, 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 oh no, baby. Baby, baby, no, baby, 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 oh, baby, can you be mine? Boop.